It's my um, pleasure to uh, introduce you today to Jeff Petruska, the uh, venerable Jeff Petruska. He um, did his grad um, studies with Rick Johnson at the University of Florida, and then he uh, did some uh, visiting science studies at the University of Bristol with Sally Lawson, where most importantly he learned to speak English. Um, and then he did his postdoctoral training with Lorne Mendel at uh, Stony Brook, um, where he was an associate in the Christopher and Donna Reeve um, committee, uh, where he met the likes and worked with the likes of Rusty Gage and Albert Aguayo, amongst others. Um, but the, undoubtedly, his most esteemed period of his career was when he uh, started his his. Uh, tenure track position at uh, the Kentucky Spinal Cord Injury Research Center in Louisville where he was my mentor. So uh, <laughs> so he, he had the honor of being my uh, postdoc mentor. Um, and I guess we're going to find out if he's, uh, if he's coping without me. So I think the, the appropriate thing for me to say right now is cheers, Ben. <laughs> and I'm not coping very well without him. So thank you all very much for the invitation to come speak. Maine is one of my favorite places in the world. Is this, is this okay, not too loud? Okay. Um, love it up here. This is a beautiful, and I've been looking forward to coming up here. Uh, before I go any further, I just want to start by saying thank you to some people. Uh, um, most of the work I'm going to talk about today was done predominantly by Chris Rao, who's a senior scientist in the lab. Um, some of the work was done by Ben, and I'll give him credit for uh, a single statement in the lab one day that sort of put me onto a path. And uh, some of the other work that we've done involved in this is a collaborator, Kate Hill at, at Burke. And um, it was funded a little bit by NIH, some from the Kentucky Spinal Cord Injury uh, Trust Fund, and the rest of it is from my kids' college fund. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Ben was, I actually was telling the story today to Ian that um, I hired Ben before I showed up in the lab. Um, I really wanted to work with him. And he and Chris are, were absolutely fundamental to uh, any success that I have. Uh, they were both there very early took a risk coming to a, a new new scientist lab. So they had uh, they did a great job, and they had a lot of fun. Um, and they were part of a lot of things that started, not just my lab, but also the Sox Society. Ben is a founding member of that. And this is an opportunity for you guys to ask him what that is. He eventually left my lab, um, but worked on the same project, and went over to the laboratory of bioinformatics. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about that. And he always had a propensity for being able to do these things, and it was very, very helpful in the lab. And Eric Rushka is here as uh, his other postdoc mentor. We're, we work very closely together. And that's how Ben started out. <laughs> and by the time he was finished with, uh, with Eric Rushka, um, he was ready to be sent off into the real world with his two bits of protection, his bear spray and his fiance. <laughs> And now he is fully prepared to spend his time here with you guys being productive. <laughs> and this is how I picture him up here. I think he's doing slightly better than that. So um, I was tempted to talk about the project that Ben and I worked on together from scratch, because it was a, a, a really, it was a work of love from both of us. And it took a long time. When he showed up in the lab, we did a lot of building and a lot of exploring um, from a big data set. And it turned out to be really great. And that project is looking at the difference in molecular control of axon growth from injured neurons versus uninjured neurons. And it, it's going really well. We're both continuing on it. And I decided, you know, you guys are going to hear more about that from Ben. I'm going to leave this story to him. And instead, we're going to talk more about another project in the lab that is looking at the sensory neuron role in um, chronic uh, post-surgical pain or tissue damage induced pain. And um, I know you guys uh, are quite familiar with this, but there might be some who aren't, and I'll step back into a little bit of gross anatomy for any of the med students in the lab. And the sensory neurons sit in the dorsal or posterior root ganglia, 
and those are positioned at the intervertebral foramen in between all of our vertebrae. And so these are the spinal sensory neurons that we're going to be talking about. And I'll say right up front that there are lots of mechanisms for pain. They reside in a lot of places in the nervous system and the tissue. Our focus here is on the sensory neuron role in pain. So there are lots of other places where things can happen, but that's, that's going to be our focus. So we know a lot about some of the risk factors and the etiology of pain after surgery or tissue damage. And some of the best predictors are things like nerve injury, um, pain prior to your surgery. Um, there is a genetic com component to this. There's a lot of psychological factors, et cetera. But the best predictors are actually nerve injury or um, chronic inflammation. And all the best predictors together get us to about a 10% 10 10 prediction power, which means we really still can't predict when someone is going to undergo or turn into having chronic neuropathic pain. And that's a real problem. It also tells us that we don't know nearly enough about the mechanisms underlying this. When you have an event, how does that event go from something that's a useful pain, I'll get my hand off the hot stove, stop stepping, stepping on the tack, how does that turn into the really nasty, neuropathic, useless, interfering type pain? We're not there yet. Turns out this year is, uh, was declared by the International Association for uh, uh, pain, uh, Study of Pain, IASP, as the global year against pain after surgery. It is a huge problem. Depending on the kind of surgery you have, there are, thoracotomy is a great example, over 60% of thoracotomy patients undergo that they have chronic neuropathic pain after the, after the event. And it can be something simple. Um, you can get 10% or more after cesarean section. At some point in time after a C-section, the woman will have dysesthesias, chronic pain, etc. We still don't know why. So it's, it's, it, is, it is a problem. And one of the most frustrating areas for both basic scientists and clinicians alike is tissue damage. And by that, I mean anything that you guys have experienced by falling, by scraping your knee, by having an incision, etc. So there are a lot of pain, a lot of pain that comes from unknown etiology, things where there was not a known nerve injury, not where there was a known uh, degeneration of a joint, something like that. And, and yet these folks can have the same sort of debilitating chronic pains as anybody else or somebody who, who had a nerve injury. So that's kind of where we started to look. And if you look through some of the thinking about tissue damage induced pain um, and chronic pain after, after surgery or tissue damage, you come up with two major words and two major functions that the field as a whole go after. And that is inflammation and nerve injury. So inflammation kind of makes sense. It's the same kind of uh, pain that you get with a sunburn or, or even, even a mosquito bite. Um, that kind of sensitization makes your sensory neurons much more sensitive, makes them more reactive to the same stimulus, makes them more easy to stimulate, turn on, and send their signals. And this is the major focus. These are the major foci of the work that is trying to understand the mechanisms of chronic pain. We look at inflammation and its effect on sensory neurons, spinal cord, etc., and we look at nerve injury. But we can have, patients have, chronic neuropathic pain that anti-inflammatory drugs can't touch, which means it's not really an inflammatory type pain. And there's no obvious sign of a nerve injury. But they have had tissue damage. They have broken a bone. They have done any number of things. But there's tissue damage. So neither of these major foci actually account for what's going on. And, you know, there's there might be a little bit of a reason for this, and some of it's the basic scientist's fault. Um, we have problems. So if you guys have seen uh, a Von Frey fil filament threshold um, type thing, this is a, uh, data from withdrawal reflex. And if the threshold is lower, essentially that's higher nociception. This is a pain state. And this is what it looks like. Right? You can do something. Um, this is actually an incision in the paw. Very, very low threshold. So this animal does withdrawal reflex very, very easily very uh, to, to just the fine filaments. This is a condition where the animal is sensitized. The problem is that all the animal models, they all kind of recover. 
There's no animal model of incision or tissue damage that shows us an ongoing pain state like we know exists in a large population of patients. So this is indeed a real problem. So then the question is, are the animal models unsuitable? Are we, are we just looking at this the wrong way? Do we have to not do this in animals? Do we have to do it in humans somehow? Or maybe are there other factors at play? We know that there are masking systems that exist at a number of different levels in, in the nervous system. Um, some of them better documented than others. That's my statement for, for you. <laughs> um, and it can simply be numbers. Sometimes something's just not big enough. Uh, an incision that's really small might not lead to a pain, whereas an incision that's really big would. So we have to consider, consider these things as well. And I got into this a little bit because uh, concept here that I'm going to introduce is, is one that talks about descending pain modulation. Um, I come from the spinal cord injury world as well as, as pain, and spinal cord injury, this is a system that is lost. And so this is the system that allows you to sort of mentally override uh, signals that come in and tell you to do something because, because you're in pain. And diffuse noxious inhibitory controls is one of them. Some, they're based on a number of neuropeptides, endogenous opioids, et cetera. And it's, it's a very powerful system. And in looking at some of the work that was done on these, uh, we know that after some event, let's see if I can get that. After some event, you're going to get an increase in pain. And a couple things happen. Um, if it's inflammatory pain, it's going to resolve. The inflammation usually will go away, or you can give anti-inflammatories, et cetera. And then there's an adaptation phase. And so the pain behavior, the pain sensation that people report and the animals show in their behavior kind of resolves over time, much as I showed you with that Von Frey filament. Uh, we also know that in many cases, the masking systems will start to be turned up in relation to whatever it was uh, that the nervous system uh, did. If you had an ongoing pain because of the inflammation, you can have a descending modulation of that. Sometimes it works better, sometimes it works worse. This might be one of the places where the genetic component of, of chronic pain can come into play if somebody has a dysfunctional masking system. And one of the reasons that we know that a masking system exists is because you can go in and block some of the neurotransmitters or some of the systems that are the masking system. And what happens in some of those cases is that the pain behaviors come back, which tells you that perhaps, uh, and I'm going to um, I actually just pulled some data from one of those papers, and, and I, I didn't want to get into a whole lot of it, and I actually made this um, for a grand rounds. I want you to notice the patterns. The controls are at the top, the flat lines, and all of these drops are increases in pain behavior that were initiated because the blocking mechanisms, the masking mechanisms, were blocked with pharmacological agents. What that shows you is that very, very long term, this is months after the initiating injury, something is resident in the nervous system that would drive pain if it were allowed to. Instead, it's masked. And so the animal behaves normally, etc. But there's some, something underlying this. And one of the researchers in the field has, has referred to this as a latent sensitization. It's sitting there, it's subliminal. And, but it is a sensitization. The concept here is that people have shown that failed inhibition or blocked inhibition may contribute to a persistent pain state, but we still don't know what the source of that persistent pain is. If you give these masking inhibitors and anti-inflammatories, it doesn't change. Those, those drops in, in this in the thresholds, they don't go away. It's not an inflammatory type pain that's still there. So where does that come from? The theory is that something else happens and that is maintained. So there's something that happens at the time of some initiating injury and that sticks around. The question is, what is that? So we started thinking about some things that we found in terms of this concept. And we know that Tissue inflammation is one of the things people think about for tissue damage-induced chronic pain. 
It has been entirely unsatisfactory in dealing with that. You can give tons of anti-inflammatories and you can really knock down acute post-surgical pain and still get pain later on. Nerve injury is the other one. That has both short-term and long-term effects. Where do you put, where do you put tissue damage? Where do you put the kind of injury that induces an inflammation but doesn't seem to fit the mold? You can get tissue damage-induced chronic pain without it being due to inflammation and without there being an obvious injury to a nerve. Right now, the field considers tissue damage as lumped in with tissue inflammation. And I'm going to argue that maybe that's in the wrong place. And I'm going to argue that this, sorry, that this result where everybody says, oh, there's no animal models where we can see a persistent effect. I think maybe we're just not looking at them properly. And it's the classic example of we're looking for our lost keys under the lamppost because that's where we can see. So there's a, a there's been a really long period where we've discovered a ton of things about nociceptors and sensory neurons and spinal processing that leads to pain perceptions. And there's really been no big advance on turning those into treatments or really understanding some of the fundamental mechanisms uh, beyond things that we've kind of already known. Um, and so the field as a whole really pushed to have changes in behavior as a qualifier for moving on to investigate mechanism further. And what that meant was, if you think you have a target that's involved in X, Y, or Z that leads to pain, you better show that can affect a von Freiherr test or a Hargraves test, or it's not going to be worth going after. And for anybody who uh, has seen these, you know what they're about. Um, but all of them are withdrawal reflexes. They are all the same thing of get your hand off the hot stove. We do it in mice and rats using a hind pause. And we pick, how fast do they pick it up? What's the energy required to make them do that withdrawal reflex? Every single one of these tests goes after a single component of that reflex. They all go after the threshold. What is the energy required to initiate the reflex? And that's fine. It's very convenient. It actually works very nicely to tell us if threshold has changed. It's not bad. It is not a bad thing. But there are more components to a behavior, including a reflex, that must be considered. Most notably, amplitude, duration. It's a very different thing to put your hand on the stove and just pull it off and go, OK, fine, as opposed to, oh my god, that really hurt, and you're jumping around the kitchen. Um, and we have to do this sort of thing in spinal cord injury and trying to you know, examine when if we do a treatment that gets an animal to locomote. Well, is it the same kind of locomotion? We have to analyze all the various components of these behaviors. It's the very same thing for reflexes. These two gentlemen are not walking the same way. There are very different amplitudes and durations to these essentially same functions. So for the withdrawal reflex, the characteristic that's measured is threshold. And we know that short term, you can do uh, after tissue damage, nerve injury, inflammation, there is a major decrease in the threshold of the withdrawal reflex. That's measurable. We know it. it's been around for a long time. The long-term effects looking at threshold of withdrawal reflex show us nothing. That's the big no-no. That doesn't show up. But the withdrawal reflex, as it's done now, doesn't tell us anything about amplitude or duration. So that's kind of a question. And I will tell you that we backed into this. I'll jump ahead a little bit, and I'll say we discovered some changes in the sensory neurons. And I thought, why does this not affect the withdrawal reflex? What I'm seeing in the sensory neurons should absolutely be reflected unless something else is going on. And I thought, well, OK, what if what the sensory neurons are doing just isn't showing up in the withdrawal reflex? So let's go after amplitude and duration. So we started using another model system. It's called the cutaneous trunchi model. Uh, sorry, cutaneous trunchi muscle system, and, and Ben may have talked a little bit about this. And it's this really cool little reflex. Um, if you have cats, or dogs, pigs, or horses, um, it's the CTM, cutaneous trunchi muscle, also the panicular muscle, uh, origin in the upper humerus, and inserts along the back skin. 
of the animal. And in, you can see it in cats, if they're sleeping, pet them, the back skin moves, horse gets flies off of it by the skin contracting. In rats and mice, they actually have it, but it's nociceptive specific. Light touch does not drive it in rats and mice, and so unless you're like me, pinching rats, you won't even know they have it. And um, it's a really nice little reflex, and I've done a lot to characterize it, and I'll tell you a little bit about how it works. So if you give a stimulus to the skin that is transduced by the segmental sensory neurons, there's uh, information that's transferred there at the level. Appropriate spinal neurons take that information up to the, lump, uh, sorry, the brachial enlargement. The motor neurons for this muscle actually come out the brachial plexus. So it's at least three neurons, two synapses, and there's some modulation in there as well. But it's also a very local sign. So it's actually like hundreds of reflexes in parallel. It's really cool. Um, and I should stop talking about it because I can go on. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about what it looks like right here. So as we pinch, you'll see contractions about a centimeter more rostral to where the pinch is. And that's what it looks like. Now, one downside to the reflex is that we can't, at this point, I think Ben's working on this a little bit, but we, we can't get any information on threshold. But it's really good for giving us information about amplitude and duration. And so we're sort of complementary to the withdrawal reflex here. Um, so what did we do? We went and we decided we're going to take a look using the CTM reflex and ask a question. When you do an incision in the skin, and an incision that we intentionally designed to not cut any of the peripheral nerves, only to damage the tissue itself, um, and of course the axons that are resident in the tissue. Granted, we do think that's actually it's happening and it's key. We've done an incision up in the, um, the dorsal part of the back skin of, of the rat. And this is a little schematic about, about where we place it. And we then go in and give a standardized mechanical stimulus, a pinch, and we ask questions of the, the kinematics of this reflex. So those dots are all there so that we can video record this and then tag them as we, as we did uh, in the first video. And then we can actually look at the speed of movement, how far these dots came together, et cetera. And um, as a neurophysiologist, I thought that this was the most boring thing in the world, but it's actually gotten very exciting. I'd rather poke a neuron, but watching dots move turns out to be pretty cool. So one of the things that, you can, that we'll do is we'll just and, and there's tons of data because you can analyze the motion of any of these things in relation to each other. Um, so what we're going to do is measure the distance between these two dots, which are essentially um, the focus of the contraction induced by pinching here. And we'll measure the distance between them, uh, both before and after um, the pinch, how long it took to relax, how fast they got there, et cetera. So here's a little bit of what it looks like. So there they are after, you know, so the end of the contraction. And so we can take the difference between um, pre-stim and post-stim. Sorry, that's not the one I wanted. This is. And this is how long it takes. This is running quarter speed, I should, I should mention that. But then we can go in and, and ask, how long did it take for the muscle to go back to its original length. And that basically we're using that as a, as a duration of reflex because if there's no uh, neural drive to the muscle, flatten right back out. So we can measure those things. And what we have here is I want to point out that this is 28 days after our experimental incision that we've done these measurements. It is we take our staples out at seven to 10 days as per IACUC, but also because the skin is healed. By all accounts, uh, inflammation is done by 14 to 21 days. This is 28 days. And what we find is that when we compare injured, to, uh, so incised skin to non-incised skin, there's a significant increase in the contraction distance, so how far that muscle contracted, 
how fast it contracted, both of which tell us about the amplitude of the response, and how long it took for that muscle to go 80% of the way back to where it was before the pinch. So this is a recovery, and this gets to the idea of the duration of this response. So amplitude and duration, we actually show, are significantly increased in the pronosusceptive direction 28 days after a single skin incision. And if you watch these things, and I've probably watched way too many of these reflexes in my life, um, thousands of them, and I'm going to show you some things that we never see in a normal animal. Oh, darn it. Um, let's try this. So there's our first contraction, and there's relaxation, and there's a twitch. Watch up top, another twitch. 10 seconds after the first twitch, which is long after the recovery. I've never seen that before. I've driven this reflex every way you can think of, and I've never seen something like that. It's almost as if there's some ongoing drive. You know, I don't want to speculate too much, but I've never seen that kind of behavior. But you get it if there was an incision. So we know that there's a long history of animal work on post-incisional pain that shows essentially nothing long-lasting. But if we look another way, I think the animal models actually can show us that there's something persistent there. So I think that you know, we are, we're offering something that's a little bit complementary to what's out there now. The CTM reflex can tell us a little bit about amplitude and duration. And I, I actually don't have any short-term data on this. Um, we've only looked long-term. Uh, but amplitude and duration look like they have significantly increased using this reflex as, as the readout. So again, great. Now we can show animals actually do perhaps mimic what we see in humans, but we're still stuck with the major mechanisms being inflammation and nerve injury. And I think those are still insufficient to get where we need to go. We need to identify biological processes and responses to tissue damage, which might qualify as potential mechanisms. And I like to think of it like that. You have to meet certain criteria to be considered a legitimate mechanism for this. So we know that tissue damage induces inflammation. Inflammation will sensitize a sensory neuron, which could lead to the types of things I talked about, except that you get unsatisfactory results with this. Anti-inflammatories don't, oh, sorry. Um, inflammation doesn't account for this. Nerve injury does a heck of a job, but this is tissue damage. We did not cut the nerves, but what if tissue damage actually induces a cellular response in the sensory neurons that's similar to, or maybe even the same as, nerve injury. Maybe we're just calling it the wrong thing, thinking about it the wrong way. So we ask that question. If you do an incision, do you get a response in sensory neurons that looks like nerve injury in any way? And the thing that we used for this was expression of a transcription factor called ATF3. ATF3 is absent in non-injured neurons, non-stressed neurons. It's just not there. It's in lots of places constitutively throughout the, throughout the body, but not in the nervous system. It's induced by overt injury of peripheral nerves. So it was first um, discovered uh, in, in, in traumatic brain injury, but then it was brought to the fore um, after nerve crush and nerve transection. All the neurons start to express ATF3. It's a really nice marker because it's off to on. It's a toggle. It's a really good marker for that. And cells expressing ATF3 are exhibiting an ongoing cell stress response. And so we did some quantification of this. And it turns out that if you do a skin incision, you actually get ATF3 induced in sensory neurons that innervate the skin that was incised. And we knew ATF3 was part of this response. But the other thing we wanted to do was say, OK, OK, we can't just say that it's cell stress response, it's like a nerve injury and regeneration type response just on ATF3. So we asked the same question of other known nerve injury related markers. Galanin, NPY is actually up there. NPY is huge, but it's so variable it actually didn't make statistics. GAP43, GAP45A, and there's a panoply of them that we've tested. And so it really looks like when you do a skin incision, your sensory neurons react much the same way as if there were a nerve injury. 
So we know that inflammation doesn't really account very well for a persistent pain that's immune to, uh, that re is resistant to anti-inflammatories. I should point out that you can, in fact, have a long-lasting inflammatory pain. But as Dr. Levine has said probably many times, that's really like a chronic acute pain. And it, the time label on these is probably not appropriate. It's really that inflammation difference. And so we're going to take out all of the stuff that's inflammation related. And we want to know about the stuff that's resistant to the anti-inflammatory drugs. And we're going to propose that sensory neuron, cellular stress, may be a mechanism through which you get persistent pain. So in terms of qualifying a biological response as a potential mechanism, we asked ourselves some questions. Does ATF3 expression persist for a meaningful duration? Or because it's a transcription factor, it could be transient and something that it controlled could be lasting a long time. We didn't need to go to that because it turns out that ATF3 expression does persist for a really long time. So this is a qPCR for the mRNA uh, from a ganglion that houses neurons that were involved in a skin incision. So we can see is, is the very typical type of response that has been described before, even with uh, nerve transection. It's a peak followed by a plateau that's a little reduced. Again, I want to remind you that this persists after the wound has healed. The shape of this curve is very similar to the original publication from Sugino, where they did a nerve transection. And it's important that even though you know, this looks like it's gone down, it's still highly significantly different. It is still upregulated. And we've done some, uh, we've actually talked quite a bit of quantitative <laughs> Uh, immunistic chemistry on this, and large cells appear to lose their expression of ATF3. And as a reminder, large cells in the dorsal ganglion are predominantly low threshold mechanoreceptors. Medium and small cells are most often nociceptors. So the cells that maintain their ATF3 expression for this persistent period of time are most likely a vast majority of the nociceptors. So it looks like it sticks around. And I should point out there, 63 days, right? This is a, a graph that we've done for 28, but we've gone out as far as 63 in other experiments, and the ATF3 is still there. So we wanted to know a little bit more about the, the individual cells that were involved here. So we did a tracer injection. So we incised the right side of the animal for as an access incision. It's not the experimental incision. We injected dye eye into the skin on the left side waited for it to transport so it's gone back to the cell bodies and then we do our experimental incision in a, in a place that's just uh, just outside of that uh, tracer injection and the reason we did that is because we wanted to make sure that the mRNA that we were seeing going up was actually in the neurons not the satellite cells etc and as it turns out it is in the neurons and it's in the neurons that have taken up the tracer because they were near the incision so um, the blue here represents the number of neurons that we're expressing. Uh, and it maps very nicely in terms of pattern along with the RNA. So for it to qualify for the cellular stress response to qualify, and we're using ATF3 expression as the surrogate, it needed to be in the right place at the right time. And we think that we've met that criteria. But if we're looking at a model for post-surgical pain, uh, I think probably none of us have walked into the doctor's office and they just start cutting on us. Right? At least I hope not. Um, we're given local anesthetics, regional anesthesia, anti-inflammatory drugs afterwards. These are standard clinical treatments that even the people who go on to have chronic pain after surgery, they get these treatments. So if our process that we're studying is going to qualify as a mechanism for chronic post-surgical pain, it better be resistant to these standard clinical treatments. And so we tested this. And what we did um, in this experiment here was to test the effect of uh, local anesthetic. So again, we did a right side access incision. Pulled the skin back a little bit, as you can see in the, in the upper uh, left panel there, exposing the dorsal cutaneous nerves. And we put a perinerve um, injection of bupivacaine on to T9, T10, T12, T13. And what this did was uh, allowed us to map where the CTM reflex was gone. And 
meaning that the local anesthetic had its desired effect. It was blocking conduction from skin to spinal cord. And then we did an incision into the part of the skin that could not drive the CTM reflex. That meant that it was neurons whose action potentials were being blocked, just like you would have in the local anesthesia before surgery. And if you put that incision into, those, into this field, no difference in ATF3. You still get an upregulation of ATF3 within four days after that incision, which tells you that the local anesthetic, at least given a, in a single dose, who knows about more, but at the single dose, much as you would get uh, clinically, did not prevent ATF3 expression in neurons that serve that skin. What about local anesthetic and anti-inflammatories? So in these experiments, we have four groups here. Um, we have our control of a skin incision without treatment. Uh, again, this was an access uh, incision, but it also serves as, as a control. And we did the same experiment in this animal where we gave bupivacaine. This was to, both of these were to provide a backdrop for this group, which on the right side had a skin incision, and the animal was treated with ketoprofen every other day for a week. And the dose we used was the exact dose that has been described as alleviating immediate inflammatory post-surgical pain. And we gave it every other day for a week. So this is a clinically meaningful dose. And the last was the dual um, treatment. So this animal had the same thing, bupivacaine given to the, uh, the dorsocutaneous nerves before the incision. So the right side was a ketoprofen only, the anti-inflammatory. The left side served as the double treatment, which you probably would get if you went to the doctor's office and had uh, a procedure, which is anti-inflammatory and local anesthetic. And in no case was the expression of ATF3 prevented uh, I dare say that if you give ketoprofen, um, actually things might get worse, but that's another story. So, in terms of another qualification, potential qualification for this mechanism, it has to be resistant to standard clinical treatments. I think we've also met that criterion. It's resistant to local anesthetics and anti-inflammatories. If you injure the skin in the presence of those clinical treatments, you still get the expression of this ATF3. So, this suggests that inflammation might not be, we know that uh, the pain is insensitive to anti-inflammatory drugs. And one of the things we wanted to get after was, okay, so it's not necessary, but is it sufficient? Could the inflammation that's associated with an incision, could that response actually lead to the ATF3 expression? So is it necessary that you cut the axons to get this response in the sensory neurons? Or can the inflammation itself drive a cellular stress response? And it might seem a little tedious, but the idea is maybe inflammation without any of this other stuff, inflammation alone can eventually give you this cell stress response. And so one of the things, we went back to that bupivacaine preparation. This is the same one that I described before. And instead of doing an incision uh, sorry, we mapped the T11 dermatome. So what we did here is anesthetize the T9, T10, T12, and T13 nerves. And what that did is give you an isolated functional dermatome for T10. And we gave incisions that marched progressively closer to the T11 border. We started at five millimeters away, three millimeters, one millimeter. And the point there is that as you get closer, you are inducing an inflammation in the T10 dermatome, but you're not incising the skin. So you're providing to those neurons an environment that is very similar to an incision, but you haven't actually damaged those axons. And the answer there is no deal. Those neurons do not express ATF3. So the inflammatory environment of the incision is insufficient to get a cell stress response. You have to actually cut the axons. So, well, we thought we had pretty good qualification there. We're like, okay, this might actually work. Let's go look and see if there's a functional outcome for these things. <clears throat> 
And so what we did here was we started looking and are asking the question, does the incision and the induction of ATF3 actually affect sensory neuron function at all or in a meaningful way toward what we saw with the behavior? And to do this, we injected dye into the skin. So dye eye, it's a lipophilic retrograde tracer, sticks around for a long time after you inject it. Injected in the skin, it's taken up by the axons right here and transported back down the nerve to the cell bodies, right here in the, in the posterior ganglion. Right? You have some of those cells, which you now know were connected to the skin that you just injected. Of course, that DRG has a lot of other cells in it, and it's a big mixture. So that's why we put the tracer in, because when you take those cells out and mix them up, if there's no tracer, you can't tell one from the other. But now we can track our traced neurons. Put them in a dish, and we can do patch clamp electrophysiology on them. Uh, this work is all done by Chris Rao. Um, he's really good at this. And so that's exactly what we did here. We traced skin, waited for the dye to get back to the sensory neurons, and did our experimental incision. And then we started asking questions of those sensory neurons that were traced, had the dye eye in them, versus not traced. So the animal had something done to it, so we're comparing the, those involved with the incision versus not. And we, we measured all kinds of things with them, but for right now, we'll tell you about uh, readouts for excitability and activity. And some of the stuff uh, I want to remind for, for some of the students is based on the principle of intensity is encoded in frequency. There's also a labeled line here because we're going after probably nociceptors instead of some other kind of transduction, but the principle of intensities encoded in frequency would dictate that for the same kind of neuron hooked up to the same sort of circuitry, more action potentials faster is going to signal a more intense stimulus. And that comes into what I'm going to talk about here. So what we're showing you here is real base. It's a measure of the minimum depolarizing current required to fire an action potential. So at uh, small depolarizing stimuli, you don't get an action potential, but the black trace here is, is where you fire an action potential. And so we would call real base at 300 picoamps. The lower the real base, the easier it is to fire the action potential. That means the cell is more excitable. This is what the response of a standard sensory neuron, spinal sensory neuron, looks like from uh, dissociated preparation. And I'll point out that these, these are acute dissociations. This is not 24 or 48 hour culture. Take them out, put them in the dish, let them sit for two hours, record. And this is what you get. As you increase, you get up to a point where you fire an action potential, but you rarely fire more than that. This is a cell body type response. It's not necessarily an axon res response, but it is very typical. This is what we see from a population of neurons, not all, but a population of neurons that were traced from incised skin. I don't want my nociceptors acting like this. I don't know about you. Um, they fire at a lower threshold. At greater um, depolarizing stimuli, you get much higher frequency and much longer response. This is cellular sensitization. And so did our experiment. We did incision, looked at rio base. Yay, rio base has gone down. We have found a sensitization in the sensory neurons. This is actually really cool because honestly, nobody had really seen this before. First of all, nobody had ever looked this far out after an incision where they've looked at the sensory neurons and their physiology because based on withdrawal reflex, there's nothing to look for. So there's no reason to go look out there. I do lots of things with no reason. <laughs> So then we went and looked, I said, we, we have these cells that are firing all these action potentials. Let's go, you know, let's do the stats on this. I got another John Oliver, right? Nope, we got nothing. This is exactly what the whole field sees. This plot right here, I can show you in 50 other papers. And we were like, great. But we knew there was something there. And I said, well, okay, why is this? What are we missing? We know these two cells do not look alike. Why were things not statistically significant there? Because of the spread. Well, we're doing tracing and we're doing dye eye. 
and we're looking at ATF3, let's do that in the actual neurons we record from. So on a single cell level, we were able to hatch clamp, pull off our electrode, fix the dish, and go back and look for the cells we recorded and stain them for ATF3. Now we're not perfect at this, you can cover about 80%. Chris has gotten much better. Um, and what you can see is that in the non-incision animals, believe it or not, there's actually ATF3 expressed there too. And we think that's actually, we know, um, needle injection. And we were a little bit rough with it at first. <laughs> We've gotten better with this. But you do get ATF3 expressed in the non-incised animals, much smaller number. Um, but now if you do an incision, you can see that it's, it's reversed. About 65 to 70% have the dye eye, 30% um, of those that have the dye eye, sorry, of those that have the dye eye, about two thirds are ATF3 positive and a third are not. This is okay. You know, the dye eye is gonna spread. All the axons that get traced might not actually be involved in the incision. So the dye eye is a nice indicator, but it's not the final test. This is what I showed you about rear base. We have a statistically significant decrease in rear base, which means an increase in excitability. If you break that up based on ATF3 expression, everything starts to make a lot more sense. In both groups, regardless of the treatment, ATF3 expressors, way more excitable. This, this plot, which is the maximum number of action potentials fired during that depolarizing pulse, which was not remotely significant when you look at all of them lumped together, becomes nicely significant when you break them up based on ATF3 expression. So they're more excitable, they fire more action potentials, and this is what a plot looks like if you look at the mean firing rate across a, a broad range of these depolarizing stimuli. So the x-axis shows you increasing um, depolarizing stimuli, so, so stronger, and, and the y-axis shows you the firing rate of the neurons. There's no difference here. The red are the incision, the green are, but this is when you consider all the cells together. So let's look at them separately. The green is no incision, all neurons. Break that up into the non-incision ATF3 expressors, ATF3 non-expressors, you get a massive difference in those populations. They clearly break out into clouds of normal response with like one or two action potentials versus those that fire, you know, in some cases, up to 100 in a second. Same thing for incision. ATF3 is what actually tells you what the behavior is going to look like. Not incision versus not incision, it's the ATF3. So the ATF3 expression, this marker of cellular stress, segregates the cells and reveals the persistent effects and pain-related properties. So have we identified a potential mechanism? I think if observed differently, there's a persistent pain behavior after skin incision that we can see with a different reflex test. Concomitantly, the electrophysiology shows us something we can see long after the initial incision. We know that the ATF3 expression, which we're using as our surrogate for this cellular stress response, requires injury to the sensory neurons. Inflammation alone doesn't do it, at least how we tested it. I actually think that long enough inflammation will damage the tissue enough to get this, but that's another story. Um, this occurs in spite of common clinical treatments, which means all the things that we do to stop acute pain are great, they're very effective, they make everybody happy, they don't prevent the potential of chronic long-term pain. And this ATF3 and the cell stress persists for a long time in many sensory neurons. So this is the original way that, uh, that the field, I showed you the field is thinking about where tissue damage fits in the scheme of things with other uh, etiological factors. Tissue damage is lumped in with inflammation. I think instead we need to start considering at least the long-term effects of tissue damage on sensory neurons, much more like nerve injury. And to me, it seems to make a lot more sense that way. So, uh, till 1.15, am I, yes? Good, I was not sure we are gonna get to this. So we were very happy with all this stuff. And one day, I looked at some of my data and it was a little bit, a little bit annoying. I said, there's a skin incision. Where's the ATF3? It broke the code. And there was no ATF3. But, all right, so we went back and looked at the records. Turns out we didn't actually screw it up. What we did 
was run out of staples and suture. And so I glued the incision closed. No ATF ring. Well, reduced, not no. Dramatically reduced. And this is at the RNA level where you can see it. Actually, the protein level, it's almost none of it there. Just by gluing it closed. Don't ask me how it works. I don't know. I have some ideas about it. But then I actually started thinking more about why it might work. And there were some tricks that people had played in the spinal cord injury world to try and rescue neurons after injury. And so I played one of those tricks. And I, and I apologize in advance. I can't tell you what that trick is. I'm sorry. But we played a trick with our proprietary compound. And it's even better than the glue. This is, uh, this is RNA. And this is significantly reduced from what you get with uh, staples. So this is uh, giving a drug with staples and suture, not the glue. We prevented the ATF3 from coming out. This is great, but this is again, you know, this is RNA. What about Chris's lovely electrophysiology? And we show that you can prevent the increase in excitability with a reduction of rebase. And we also show that you can put the activity, the AP frequency, the firing frequency of those neurons right back down to where it was. And I don't think it's actually reversal. I think it's a prevention. But the nice part here is that we might actually be able to modulate the cell stress response in a meaningful way. And with that, I'm going to say thank you again for the invitation. I really enjoyed being here. UNE seems like a great, really great place. Great collegiality. The students should be very happy because when your mentors are happy, you get a better education. And that looks really good here. Uh, so I'll for, for questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice talk, and I want uh, I wanted to congratulate you on your elegant techniques. It's very very nice uh, technique. So I have a question: um, Have you tested uh, these um, experiments in ATF three knockout animals? Uh, we have the mice in the lab right now, but no, we have not yet done it. Have you found an endpoint for this? Where you stay? How long can you go out before you see recovery, or does it ever happen? We haven't done the electrophys any further out or the behavior any further out than 28, 35 days. Um, I do have experiments going on in the lab based on that project that I was telling you about with, with Ben, where we injure neurons. We have looked, I, sh I said 63, we've tersely looked at 75, 90 days. It's still there. As far as we can tell, it doesn't go away. And you know, I, I can't say anything more than that. But we haven't yet found a time where ATF3 stops being expressed in the sensory neurons. And sensory neurons are a unique beast. Because even in the, um, the graph I showed you from the published paper, if you look at the motor neuron response after nerve injury, you get a big peak. And then it comes down and it plateaus right about the time that the regeneration gets close to target. And then it shuts off when you get motor functional recovery. So some neurons can shut it off. I think central nervous system neurons shut it off. Some of the DRG neurons shut it off, the large ones do. Why do the, long, the little guys not do it? I don't know. But that differential, where some neurons do, but these guys don't, I think there's something important there. We have yet to see it shut off. There. So if you look at the neurotrophic factor literature, uh, you can reverse the expression of ATF3 by applying the appropriate trophic factor to the nerve stump of a, of a nerve transaction. So have you tried reversing this with injections of trophic factors? And do you think that would work if you could get it to them? And if so, why aren't they, do you think they're just are these guys not growing back? Is there something special about these neurons that they're not growing back to their appropriate target? Okay. Um, I could talk about this for an hour. So just before I answer that, are there any other questions? I'm not avoiding him. I'm not avoiding him. That's impossible. I can't avoid him. Well, you already asked a question. Let me ask a question. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Arif. I'll talk to you later, Jeff. <laughs> no, this is, this is a broader question. Um, 
<clears throat> and actually, I want to hear that answer because I had a naive question along the same lines. But I, I wanted to kind of take this opportunity to um, to sort of articulate to the students at how difficult it is to develop an animal model that reflects human disease or morbidity, and how incredibly exciting it is to discover new knowledge while you're developing that model. And I think that's really just a very exciting aspect of science. And, and the, the dirty little secret we have is we get paid for learning stuff, yeah. which is cool. But just a little putting on my pharmacology hat, um, I was really intrigued by your original uh, uh, um, presentation of you can mask and unmask um, the pain over a course of a gazillion days. Um, and I'm wondering whether anyone ever teased out the pharmacology of that. Is there, when you're masking using opioids or whatever other pain reducing drugs, are there differences among the efficacy of those masking and unmasking? I wish I had a, a, a really detailed uh, answer for you on that. It's, it's a great question. Um, I don't know. Do, do you know? Because the ones I showed up there were dealing with both neuropeptide Y and opioid receptors. So there's a few different ways that you can unmask because there's a few different masking mechanisms. Do you? Do you? Because I, I don't have a better answer than that. You don't know? Okay. I think it's out there for people who do that descending control stuff. I don't. I know it exists. Um, and that was uh, Brad Taylor's data that I, I put up there. So um, no, I wish I, I wish I had a better answer. Okay, last one before I go back to Derek. Well, just um, most of those studies use um, opioid antagonists, yeah. and um, it's been shown to be throughout the descending uh, system. Um, so one, well, no. you never answered Derek, but also um, before, yeah. the um, what does this mean in relation to pain? I mean, does this mean that if you've experienced injury, you have a you're walking around with the idea that you're going to be hypersensitive, you know, or at risk, heightened risk for hypersensitivity, or a heightened propensity to develop like a neuropathy when undergoing subsequent right. operations or whatever. This is a, we had this conversation in the car on the way here this morning. It's an outstanding question. I, I love it. We think about that a lot. Like, why aren't we all having pain all the time from those little injuries or big injuries that we had at some point? I can't say definitively. I don't have data, but I think if you look at the data that exists sort of through this filter, like, like I've been trying to do, I think masking systems exist. They happen all the time. In fact, Taylor's work shows that neuropeptide Y is a very powerful masking system at the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and one of the uh, neuropeptides that is upregulated in the sensory neurons that are injured is neuropeptide Y. It's entirely possible that the injured neurons, in fact, participate in their own masking. What happens later on? So yeah, this might be a genetic component thing. So if you have a receptor to NPY that's just not as effective as somebody else's, one of your masking systems isn't as effective. And one injury is one injury. But what it does is possibly set you up for problems later on. One of the big problems is um, complex regional pain syndrome, where a small bit of tissue damage leads to this massive kind of pain. But if you look back through the etiology of those folks, there's almost always something else that happened at some point way back when. And so if you think maybe that's a second injury to which you were predisposed for genetics and whatever, and as I was talking about with Ian today, two injuries is very different than one. It's exactly. It's, and that's what I mean, at the same place. You can have two injuries separately and it's two single injuries. In the same place, it's a repeated incision. So. Can I ask another quick question first before you answer my first question? <laughs> yes or no answer. Is there any evidence for enhanced DNIC in patients with a history of surgery? Or in animal models? I don't know, I never thought about that. That's a really good question. Uh, diffuse noxious inhibitory controls or conditioned pain modulation? Um, I imagine Frank Pareko or, or would know that. I, that's a really good question. I hadn't thought about that. I, I don't know. So I didn't answer that with yes or no. So um, I've now conveniently forgotten it. Uh, <laughs> growth factors. So Derek's talking about a situation where you can do a nerve transection where there's clear nerve injury and you can apply different growth factors to that cut nerve. You can even take the neurons out, put them in a dish, 
and treat them with growth factors. If you give the growth factor to which the neuron is sensitive, those neurons will not express ATF3 for a while. Particularly in vivo, that prevention can go on for weeks, but eventually uh, you will get an injury response. And it doesn't look like it's perfect. It looks like there's something else. Uh, like it's started, but it's stunted somehow. And there is, um, uh, Richard Zygmunt has talked a lot about injury and regeneration being triggered either by absence of a retrograde signal or presence of a positive injury signal. And I think both of those things happen, at least he does too. So the growth factors, giving them to the injured neuron, you're basically fooling them into thinking that they're still attached to their target. And so they're gonna say, oh, I'm, I'm fine, even in the presence of a positive injury signal, but eventually the positive signal that says, hey, you've been injured, I think does take over. Um, one of the things we know about the going, growing back, if you've done an incision like we're doing here, they, you know, they're gonna regenerate, they're gonna go back somewhere. But if you look at the nerve injury data and you do a crush injury and you ask, do those endings make it back into the epidermis? The answer is no. They don't actually make it all the way home. They get close, but the epidermis doesn't get innervated by the regenerating axons. The epidermis gets innervated by sprouting axons that come in. And so it's possible, if you think about it at that really microanatomy level, I think maybe they don't make it all the way home. Does that, okay. okay. I think we're about out of time. Thank you very much. So uh, one last thing before uh, before we get out of here, I've got a, um, a gift for Jeff as, uh, as, as part of this thank you for coming. There we go. It's hey. one, one of the pictures from the paint, hey, and of course it's, it's one that I did. So. <laughs> oh, that's awesome.